to sing praises to the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name. God, we want to be very careful not to be so religious and so stuffed up, Lord, that we miss what the Spirit of God wants to do within us and through us. Lord, I pray that you would make your word, your spirit, life to us. That we would follow you, God, with earnest expectation that you will do everything that you purpose to do in us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Man, give the singing praise team a damn pen and clap of praise. Man. That's awesome. So happy. So happy right now. Let me know when you're on, Matt. Let me know when you're on. Is it on? Is it recording? Oh, okay. Praise the Lord. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Man, I got gifts and everything. Awesome. Is, no. it, is this mine? Yeah. Oh, okay. You keep it. <laughs> I don't want it back. Did you watch part of it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> What's that? Oh, <laughs> it is. It's like a documentary, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. We're gonna get started. Uh, just a reminder, the offer plate is up here. We're not passing it around. So if you guys want to give, you can give right now or while I'm preaching or while we're praying. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you and praise you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for the presence of God that is at work in every believer. Lord, I thank you for calling us, for equipping us, for sending us. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, tonight you might get a, a one of them jumping up, screaming, and shouting, preaching things. Is that okay? Well, I gotta tell you, while you were praying there, I kept sensing that there was a marching song, and I couldn't put my finger on it. You were praying there, and it started coming. The words started coming. It was like, oh yeah, I remember. I went to sleep at the end of Jesus' camp. Oh. <laughs> Don't want to get me started on that. We'll sing it all night. Oh, man, I'm ready. All right. So the title of the message tonight, and you can do me a favor and just reach over your neighbor and buckle up their seatbelt because I'm, I'm fixing to challenge you. You might want to get your feet off the floor because there's some stuff. Yeah, some toes. There's some toes that might be stomped on tonight. Praise the Lord. I want to talk to you about no more excuses. Again, I know I've preached about this before, and I'm going to preach about it again because we still live in a day and an age of excuses. And just given the temperature of everything around, I want Christians to understand that we can't do what the world does. When the world doesn't get its way, it goes insane. Children of God should not be this way. Right. Children of God's faith should be in God and not on any other thing. Amen? Amen? We seem to forget this during certain times in our life. Uh, and it seems to me, just as a pastor watching Facebook, okay? You don't understand, I'm watching folks on Facebook. And I see how people are freaking out and reacting, and I go, hold on a minute, you know Jesus, right? <laughs> because the problem is, we've invested so much of our faith in this world or the things of this world that 
so often, even though we don't mean to, and it's not our, it's not what we're trying to do, it happens. That's why Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. He either love one and hate the other, or love one and despise the other. The, the, the other doesn't happen even on purpose. The reality is when I love something, something else is taking back seat. Amen? Amen. And Christians need to be reminded of this. If it wasn't so, we wouldn't even have revelations where he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's not a message to unbelievers. That knocking on the door was not to unbelievers. He was talking to a church. He was speaking to a church. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. How in the world did Jesus get outside? Because the church began to see everything else as important. What people think about me, what people think about our music, what people think about how we, how we interact with them. You know, when I was preaching Sunday morning about how we need to take care of our people and then other people. And people get offended when you say things like that. Because the, well, you're supposed to be reaching those lost people. Yes. But I want you to notice that not one person in the New Testament church was giving, was giving financial, worldly goods help until they were in the church. The man sat outside the city gate called Beautiful. And Peter and them came by, and they just said, preached to 5,000 people, six, you know, 3,000 people got saved, and then Peter come walking by, and that beggar that sat outside there, begging for money, what did Peter tell him? Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk, right? I'm just telling you something. I'm not, I'm, this ain't preaching about who we're going to help and who we're not going to help. We want to help everybody. But the church needs to get their act together. I shouldn't care what worldly people think about my music. This music is not for them. It's not to make them happy. Right. Worship, the worship music we do, isn't even for you. It's for God. He yes. is our Amen. audience. Amen. Not the other way around. But the American church has turned worship into, we got to play what will fill the seats up. And if we fill the seats up, then we can give them this gospel. But chances are, if you're worried about what kind of music will get them here, then you're not going to preach what will get them to heaven. Because you're going to water that down. And you're going to tailor it to fit their taste and their desire. The gospel is supposed to offend you. The gospel is supposed to bring you face to face with your sin and who you are and who God is and make a difference in you. Go ahead.
sermon that will cause maybe some trepidation in your own heart and life and spirit about how we are to live our life for Christ. Is that okay? If not, I'm going to give it to you anyway. Luke chapter 14. My Bible has a title right here just before verse 25 that says the cost of discipleship. We could call this whole thing the cost of discipleship. I'm going to title it No More Excuses, and I'll show you why. Verse 25, now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, mother, wife, and children, and brothers, and sisters, and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. I want you to underline the words, cannot, okay? Make a middle note of the words, cannot, because there's a lot of people that say, well, I want to follow Jesus, but... I want to follow Jesus, except he said, if you're not willing to denounce, renounce all that you have and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. He doesn't say you might not. He doesn't say, it, you know, it's a little impossible. He said you can't even do it. So there's either I'm with Christ or I'm not. I'm either for him or I'm against him. I don't get to walk a middle line. You know, we got this old-timey saying for the last 30, 40, 60 years about uh, uh, riding both sides of the fence and all that stuff. That's a myth. You don't get to do that. Anybody that's doing that, I challenge you to look at your life and see if you have actually surrendered your life to Christ because you do not see that taught in Scripture. You can be kind of in and kind of out, a little bit here and a little bit there. It's either all or nothing. Verse 27, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Jesus uses this imperative one more time in the very next sentence. He said, unless you take up your cross, follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. That means I can't come to the cross and I can't go, well, here I am, Jesus, you get this much of me. I can't walk up to the cross that Jesus died on and expect to come out alive. Oh, you didn't get that. Let me say it again. I can't go up to the cross that Jesus died on and expect to come out of it alive. Amen. I have to die. Amen. Or I'm not born again. Amen. That's the reality. That's where we're failing in the United States in presenting the gospel. We present a gospel that says, you only got to change a little bit, Ruth. How does that happen? It happens many different ways. But the first way it happens is this. I present the gospel without an expectation. Jesus didn't do this. What's Je These are Jesus' words. If you had one of those Bibles with red letters, all of this would be red. Man. This is Jesus speaking. He says, if you do not take up your cross, deny yourself and follow me, cannot, cannot be my disciple. Meaning, the ability to be his disciple is not present while you're still holding on to you. It's not there. The ability for you to be his follower is not even present. That's what the word cannot means. It implies an inability for me to do the thing that was just said. He said, if, unless you deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. So being a disciple, therefore, must mean I deny myself, I take up my cross, and I follow him. Amen. Follow him in what? Follow him in his death. And in 
to new life. Jesus said we must be born again. He didn't say it's a good idea. He said you must. Amen? Let's keep going. I'm not done yet. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see him begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and is not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet the one who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks, terms of peace. Now, he told these two parables back to back. Boom, boom, boom. Right? Now watch his final statement. He gives another imperative. So therefore, everybody knows in the Bible when you see a therefore, you have to stop and find out what it's there for. Right? You got to stop and find out what, therefore what? He's telling you, therefore, if you want to take up your cross, deny yourself, it's going to take you counting the cost. In other words, following Christ is not, I repeat, is not a fly by the seat of your pants experience that is not cost you anything in investment of your time, your energy, and your relationship. It is free. True, the gift of God is completely free, but it will not leave you the same, and it does not come while you still live. Well, we talked about this before. So many people say about salvation, well, that's good for you, and it, you know, but I'm not there yet. Well, you better get there. Okay, because the reality is this. It's not bingo. I don't get to pick and choose which parts I like, which parts I want to do, and which parts I don't want to do. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the expectation is you're going to do this. Amen. Why? Because grace came and purchased you. Because grace came and changed you. Because grace came to teach you. And this same grace has an expectation that I'm a new creature. Amen. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become brand new. Let's finish this, uh, this verse. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. There's that word again three times in how many verses? What, five? Through, what, how many verses is that? Eight verses? Eight verses. The word cannot comes three times. Do you understand just in biblical understanding, a thing repeated is very important, right? So the words cannot, cannot, cannot in eight verses is pretty important. Jesus is not saying, you know, every Christian has their own walk and we all fall short. We do all fall short, but that's not an excuse. I can't move the mark. What we're doing when we say, well, every Christian falls short, you can, you can believe that without doing this. So I'm okay with me falling short. The minute that we become okay with us falling short, we move the mark. Amen. Amen. I'm no longer shooting at the prize. I'm shooting at an alternate prize. I'm shooting at an alternate destination. And I'm coming in saying, I'll settle for this. But I don't want just a little bit of Christ. And I don't want to just be a little bit of Christ. Amen. And if I read 
this right, I can't be just a little bit of Christ. And I can't just get a little Jesus. You understand me? Go with me to Luke chapter 8. Well, hold on. Let's go back to Luke 14. Flip, flip back a page in Luke 14 to Luke 14 and 12. I want to read this to you. I'm not going to expound upon it really greatly just yet, but I want to read it. This is a parable that Jesus told just before. He said what I just read to you, okay? Just before he says, unless you do this, you cannot. Unless you do that, you cannot. Any man who is not willing to renounce everything he has cannot. Before he says those three cannots or can'ts, he tells this parable. Luke 14 and 12. And he said to the man who invited him. Oh, go to verse 7. Excuse me, I'm halfway there. Parable of the wedding feast. Remember this one? Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor saying to them, when you are invited someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the place of honor lest someone distinguishing, uh, more distinguished than you should be invited. And he who invited you will come and say to you, give your place to this person and then you will be, begin, uh, you will begin the shame to take your own low place. But when you are invited, go and sit at the low place so that when you, when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now watch this. He said also a man who invited him. He said also to the man who invited him. When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest... They also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor people, the crippled, the lame, the blind, so that you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection. Wow. And then one of those who sat at the table reclining with him heard these things. He said to him, blessed is everyone who eats bread in the kingdom of God. He said, but I say unto you, once a, man give, once a man gave a great banquet and invited many. And the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have found, I have bought a field and I must go out and see. And I go to examine the field. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said to him, I have married a wife, therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to the master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets, into the lanes, into the city. And bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and to the hedges and compel people to come in so that my house may be full. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of the banquet. And then he tells this Eight verses where it says, unless a man hates his father and mother, sister and brothers, yea, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Unless a man is willing to deny himself, take up his cross and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. Unless you are ready to renounce all that you have, you cannot be my disciple. 
Matthew Henry makes a very interesting assessment of this, and so does Geitzer when they talk about this verse. I want to remind you of Luke chapter 8. Flip back there. The parable of the soul. I want to read this to you real quick. I pulled it up because I didn't write it down before I left the house. But I want to pull this up for you and read you from Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown when they discussed this very thing. A verse 18. He says, these three excuses give as specimens the rest of the answer. Now I want you to notice what he quotes here. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the pleasures of this life. And right there he's quoting Luke 8, the parable of the sower. And I want to go to where he explains the parable to his disciples. And when his disciples had asked him what the parable means, this is Luke 8 and verse 9, he said to them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others are, they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not hear. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard, then the devil comes and takes the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones that are on the rocks are those who hear the word, receive it with joy, but these have no root. They believe for a short while and then in times of testing fall away. And as for those that fell among the thorns, those are those who hear as they go their way. They are choked out by the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life, and their fruit is not mature. And as for those that are in the good soil, those are those who hear the word, hold fast to it. And in an honest and a good heart and bear fruit with patience. Notice that Jesus makes this story of these three men who made excuses. The first one said, I just bought a, bought a land and I must go and see it. And it's funny, Matthew Henry points something out that I didn't think about. This plot of land ain't going anywhere. Amen. Why did he have to go look at it right now? Come on. Why was it so important that it couldn't wait until tomorrow? Because ground ain't going nowhere. Okay? The ground ain't leaving. They ain't going to get up, grow two legs, three legs, four legs, and walk off. It ain't going nowhere. Come on, yeah. The problem is, we as people make every excuse we can not to follow Christ. Not to live our life like we know God wants us to. Not to follow Christ like we know in our heart and our spirit that we are uh, we are required to. Amen. 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 Yep. We make excuse, everyone. Some people said, "Boy, well, they all came and just asked. they did, they were just asking to be excused." No, they didn't go. I can't come. Notice the wording. Notice the wording in Luke 14. Okay? I want you to go back. Man gave a great banquet, right? The first one said, but they all might begin to make excuses. The first one said, I bought a field and must go out and see it. Please have an excuse. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please give me have me excused. Another said, I have married a wife, therefore I cannot come. Some people said they're all were already there, and then they left. That ain't what it says. The one with the wife said, I can't even come. You gotta notice that he sent his servant out to talk to these people, and they began. 
begin to make excuse. Have me excused. Have me excused. Have me excused. What does Jesus say? And finally, he says, for I tell you, none of those men who were invited will taste of my banquet. We've made the gospel something that I can put off till tomorrow. I'll get done living my life and I'll do things my way until I settle down and then I'll follow Jesus. But that's not how it works. You better accept and you better believe today, right now, because today is the day of salvation and you don't know what's coming tomorrow. You don't know if you're even going to be here tomorrow and we need to stop acting like we got tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. We need to come to grips and stop making excuses. It's very interesting that in all these things that Jesus tells this parable of these men that were making excuses and then he begins his next discourse as the crowds gathered around him, he says, if anyone comes after me and does not hate his own father and mother, sister and brother, yes, his own life cannot be my disciple. That's hard to marry when the only side of salvation that you think is there is all I have to do is pray this prayer, and I'm all right. But the born-again experience is much more than a prayer. It's where I die. It's where I'm made new. It's where God meets me. We've taken God out of the equation of salvation. You realize that, right? We, just, we, we think God is, is not involved. He's just send this little sinner's prayer down here and if anybody says it, the minute that they say it, immediately, just because they said it. That's not what Romans 10 says. Romans 10 and 9 says if a man believes in his heart and confess with his mouth. Belief in the heart must come first. And the problem is man can't open it. The problem is we think we're the ones opening the heart. But we can't because we were dead in our trespasses and sin. Amen. We were unable to go to God and go, God. Why? Because we didn't want to. I didn't find God. He found me. Right. I didn't go running after him. He chased me down. And when he found me and he opened my eyes, then I cried out. God, I love you and I want you. But we said, I stand at the door and knock. We have to open it. But he was talking to people he's already saved. That's true. Exactly. I'm yeah. telling you, we've Extended. lost Extended. the understanding of yes. this one thing. The Father calls those who he wills. Amen. God calls yes. us out of darkness. And into his great light. That's what he said. Amen. And we think that all these people who just said, oh, I said the sinner's prayer. I don't care how many times you said the sinner's prayer. If you did not have a face-to-face -face encounter with God Almighty where you were changed, you are not born again. Amen. I don't care what sinner's prayer you prayed. I don't care what, what I don't care if you was baptized in water. You can go down a a, a dry sinner and come up a wet sinner if you don't know Jesus. Amen. Right. And I'm telling you, friends, we need to get out of the mindset that everybody who professes Christ knows Christ. Jesus said you'll know them by their fruit. Right. A good tree cannot, that's another imperative, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. You want to know why? American Christianity looks so much like the world. I believe most of American Christianity is just the word painted up. They're, they're like nasty hogs with lipstick on. They're painted up 
They got the title, I'm a Christian. I got baptized at this church. I got baptized at that church. And they think, I'm going to heaven. But their life doesn't say, I live for Christ. Their talk doesn't say, I know Christ. There's no fruit at all on their tree. And you're wondering, all oh, like, is that what God does in salvation? Is that the born again experience where God transforms a heart just to be the exact same thing? Come on. Because that's not in the Bible. Come on. That's not what we're told in Scripture. That's not it. When someone's truly born again, God the Father is drawing them. I remember sitting, I want you to just get this picture in your mind. Most people who've been to Central Baptist Church will know what I'm talking about. I was sitting in the middle row on the north side of the building at 14 years old. Pastor Jerry Stafford was preaching. I stopped the whole service because I knew right then I needed this Jesus. I had God, the Holy Spirit, convicting me of who I was and where I was going and knew immediately that he was telling me, you need eternal life. And I cried out to God. But I didn't do it until God first Christianity because we won't preach the whole gospel. We won't preach about sin. We won't preach about knowing him. We won't preach about living for him. We don't want to do that because we'll do we'll do. It's really complicated when you start saying, Pastor, it's free, but it's going to cost you something. It is free. Come on, come on. Salvation is absolutely free. I can't earn it. I don't deserve it. There's no way that I can do anything to earn my salvation. But salvation changes the person. Amen. And if you're not changed, please repent. Come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and be saved because that's what will change you. Amen. Religion won't change you. The following rules won't change you. Let me tell you. Right. I, oh, my goodness. If I could just get you to understand, salvation is never earned never deserved but salvation bears fruit salvation bears fruit Amen. people say oh I went up there and I prayed the prayer but did you repent did you turn from you did you turn from your sin did you run away from that and run to Christ did that really happen or did you pray a prayer and then you start trying to live out this Christian life doing good works, hoping that at some point you'll really get it. You'll never get salvation that way. You'll never get salvation by works. You'll never get it by trying to earn your way there. You'll never, ever, ever get there. You see, the only way you come face to face with God in true repentance, true born again experience is this. I have to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if any part of my salvation was left up to me, I would split hell wide open Amen. like tomorrow's newspaper. Amen. I have to wholly trust in Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. He says, I, I can trust in no other name. Amen. Amen. I dare not trust in any other frame, but wholly lean on Jesus. So much of American Christianity has been turned into, it's about you. It's not about you. 
The gospel ain't even about you. It's about what Jesus did. Amen. And that affects you. But yeah, that's all that it is. You don't do anything. You understand that if you're trying to uh, look Christian, can you, you understand that people can tell when you're being phony. They can tell when somebody's really born again and, and somebody who's just going through the motions. And believe me, I went through the motions. I know people. Too many times we water it down. You can't sit in a room full of people who claim to be saved and tell them they're all sinners. Yep, I sure can. We're all sinners. Not, there ain't nobody in this room that deserves heaven. There ain't nobody in this room that, that earned heaven. There ain't nobody in this room that's going to get to heaven on any merit of their own. Because the reality is this. I had this question asked me one time. Pastor, why would God send people who are basically good to hell? Because I just think there's going to be a lot of people in hell that don't deserve it. I said, no, the gospel is this. There's going to be nobody in heaven that deserves it. Amen. But everybody in hell will be getting exactly what we should have got. This is the condemnation that has come into the world. Everyone who believes shall not be condemned. But those who do not believe are condemned already because they will not believe in the name of the one and only son of god and that belief that faith i want you to understand me a faith that does not produce change a faith that does not produce the fruit of works of good works it's not the faith that will change you james asked the question can such faith Saved. No. So faith is not just the proclamation, it's the acquisition and the subsequent change from one person to another. That is what it means to be born again. And only those who quit making excuses. You can tell when people stop making excuses. You can tell when people abandon any other hope but yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's not hard. It's not rocket science. Amen? That'd be like me walking up to Carmen and be like, I think you don't love me. Everybody in this room would know I'm alive. Amen. Right? Hmm. So when people go, I love Jesus, and we don't see the fruit, we don't see the evidence, we don't see anything at all that says you know him. Amen. Come on. Stop trying to fool. Stop trying to fool. Stop making excuses. Amen. Bow your knee. Bow your heart. Bow your life. And follow Christ. Amen? No more excuses. It's time for the church to stop giving way to excuses. Stop giving leeway to people in the church who want to make excuses because the chances are, and I'm just telling you, chances are that most of the people that want you to compromise don't even know Jesus. Most of the people, even if they say they do, if they're wanting you to compromise, they, don't have, they wouldn't be able to tell you the difference between Jesus and a rock in the middle of the road. You don't go by what you think of people. You go, you go by what God says Amen. about people. Amen? Amen. We, we, we are told to know a tree by their fruit, but then we don't look for fruit. Anything that's going to make me walk away from Jesus. It's not, it's not from God. Anybody that's going to try to make me walk away from Jesus is not from God. Amen. Anything in 
my life that will cause me to go away from Christ is not from God. It is a test. It is an it is a, a, a assault from the enemy to try to get you to compromise. That's right. Amen. Do we fail? Do we fall short? Sure we do. But like I said at the very beginning, we can't move the mark down. We can't lower the bar. We can't make it easier. Because the minute that we do that, we're not preaching the gospel. We're preaching something else. You can't add to it either. I can't, I can't just start adding more rules to you and say, this, 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 and this. That's right. That's then you're saved. Come on. Yep. No. Paul said, don't go beyond what Scripture says. So I can't go beyond what Scripture even says is required for faith in Christ, for following Christ. But Christ's own words are pretty powerful. If a man does not deny himself, take up his cross and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you and praise you for your word, for your grace, for your mercy that is in our hearts and our lives, Lord. Lord, I pray that if there's anybody in this room or anybody that would watch this on Facebook or anybody that will, uh, listens to the podcast, Lord, I pray that if they don't know Jesus Christ, that today would be the day that there's no more excuses, that there's no more line left at the end of the rope. They're at the bottom of the barrel. God, I pray that they would look up to the hills from whence their salvation comes. That they would see their self for who they truly are. That they are a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. That nothing they could do could get them to heaven. Nothing they could say is good enough. Nothing they could do is good enough. But the only thing they have left is to cry out to Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you would make that sound that call so sure and so effective in their life, Lord, that they would turn to you in full faith, fully abandoning their former life and running headlong after you so that they could come to the saving knowledge of who Jesus is. Lord, I pray that you would call 